Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor here at Walden Community Church. And today we are going to talk about Noah. That's right, Noah's Ark. Now, I realize uh, I preached on this actually five years ago. Five years ago, so you'll have to forgive me for going back to a subject uh, we've covered before. But, you know, as a pastor, that's always the challenge. Can you find something new to talk about? Can we offer something maybe that makes us think about the story in a brand new way? Let me show you something. This is the Epic of Gilgamesh. The Epic of Gilgamesh is a poem from ancient Mesopotamia. It was discovered in 1853. It's written in cuneiform. It's on 12 clay tablets. It was found by a Turkist Assyriologist at Nineveh in the library of an Assyrian king. And since I'm assuming none of us read cuneiform, <laughs> I will tell you that the poem is regarded as a foundational work in religion and in heroic stories. The main character, Gilgamesh, he becomes the archetype for later heroes like Hercules and the heroes that we read about in Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. So why do I tell you this? Well, because in this Babylonian poem is perhaps a story that is very familiar to you. Noah's Ark, yeah. Now, whenever we talk about the possibility of Noah's Ark or a global flood, there are always some people in academia that will crawl out, right? People from science, uh, either on either side, they'll crawl out and they will argue for their view, argue for their side. And one side will say, a global flood is very possible. We have river rocks, some as big as boulders that are scattered all over the U.S., miles away from any water. We also have fossils, skeletal remains of sea creatures and fish that are embedded into the walls of mountains. But there are also many who would say a global flood is not possible. There simply isn't enough water. Where would all the water go? Even if the ice that covers Antarctica and Greenland and in the mountain glaciers around the world, even if they were all to melt, the sea level would only rise 230 feet. And that is probably more reasonable that perhaps Noah's Ark and that flood was, was a local thing, but not global. Okay, but what happens to that argument when we say, well, actually, a thousand years before the biblical story of Noah was written, the Babylonians also recorded a global flood story. So even they thought the story was true. But... A thousand years before that, the Sumerians also wrote a story about a global flood. Their hero's name was Zia Sudra, and he survived a global flood. Now, of course, the names and details about the events and the characters are different from story to story. Obviously, the Babylonians and the Sumerians, they don't worship the Jewish God, but the story of a God's wrath who sends water as punishment a hero and his family survive by building a boat. That big sweeping story arc is the same. Now, I guess you could also believe the Babylonians plagiarized the Sumerian story and they made it their own. And I suppose you could also believe that the Jews plagiarized the Babylonian story and made it their own. Or maybe there is room to believe that a story as grand and as big as a global flood couldn't possibly ever be forgotten. And when stories are passed down from generation to generation, not one nation, not two nations, but three nations throughout time have told that story, which makes it even more plausible that it actually happened. And since you already know the story of Noah's Ark, let me tell you the story that comes from the Epic of Gilgamesh. This is the story of our hero. His name is Utnap Ishtim. Utnap Ishtim was a righteous man, and he lived in a world with angry gods. These angry gods decided to wipe out the human race and start over, completely wipe out, destroy everyone, a worldwide flood, no safe place to hide. 
one of those gods became fearful, afraid of starting over completely from scratch. And so secretly, one of those gods went and whispered into Utnap Ishtim's ear while he was asleep and told him to build a boat. He builds a boat 120 cubits high, 120 cubits wide, and 120 cubits tall. That means it's a cube, right? It's a giant cube. 60 meters square, that's how big it is. Utnap Ishtim and his family get in the cube. It rains for seven days and seven nights. And at the end of the rain, he takes a swallow and he lets the swallow go out through the window, but the swallow comes back. And then the boat rests on a mountaintop. He then takes a dove, sends the dove out, and it flies back. A couple days later, the water recedes even more. Utnap Ishtim takes a raven, sends it out, it flies away and never returns. And then he and his family leave the ark. He makes a sacrifice to God. God promises never to do it again. And the gods give Utnap Ishtim immortality as a reward. He can live forever. Now, if I had not told you at the very beginning that this wasn't the Noah's Ark story, how many of you would have been able to see the subtle differences? Those two stories, they're very similar. Both stories describe a global flood, both for the reason of wiping out humanity for their wickedness. Both heroes are described as righteous men. Both men are told to build a boat. Both men complained about it. Both boats were massive, several stories tall. Both boats had a single door. Both men took along their family. Both men took along all species of animals. Both released birds to see if the water had receded. Both made a sacrifice when the flood was over and both received a blessing from God. So, is the story true? Do you want to see a genius? I want to show you a picture of a genius. That is a genius. Why, Why do they always look like that? This is Irving Leonard Finkel. He is a British philologist and a seriologist. He is the assistant keeper of ancient Mesopotamian script, languages and cultures in the Department of the Middle East in the British Museum. Yep, he's a genius. He specializes in a cuneiform inscription on tablets of clay from ancient Mesopotamia. He was raised by Jewish parents. He left the faith. He became an atheist as he began to devote his life to scholarship. So in other words, this guy is not religious. He's not religious. Finkel told the London press that it's very possible that a massive flood struck the Tigris and Euphrates Valley between 5,000 and 7,000 years ago. And he believes the stories are true. So much so that he wrote a book about it. And it's nice to have an atheist academic who also believes in the flood, but we should also believe in the flood. Because more and more the world would try to pick apart things and they will dive into the biblical stories and try to make them sound silly, try to make them sound like superstition. So if there is any evidence or any sound argument that we can make, I think we should talk about those things. First, let's consider the population of the planet, right? Let's talk about it. If we started with just a small group of people, even two, let's start with two people, 4,500 years to 5,000 years ago, the world's population today from that growth would be about 9 billion people. And that's pretty much close to what it is. We're at 7 billion people. How do we get to that number? Well, that would be figuring that the population would double every 150 years, which is very conservative, uh, since it actually doubles around every 40 years. If there was not a worldwide flood, all right, so there's no flood, then we would have hundreds of thousands more people alive today, right? Because then, 4,500 to 5,000 years ago, we would have had people alive, and now the world today would have doubled at an even faster rate, and our population today would be in the hundreds of trillions. Doesn't that seem logical? Evolutionists say that humans walked the earth 50,000 years ago. 50,000 years ago. But if you use that same conservative growth rate, 
the population today would be a one followed by a hundred zeros. In fact, we would have so many people who lived and died, you couldn't even dig a hole in the earth and not find a skeleton. The entire earth's surface would be covered several feet deep in human bones. The only thing that could solve this problem scientifically, in other words, if science was gonna come back and, and come up with a solution as to why there's no, there isn't as many people in the world, they would say, oh, well then, you know, for thousands and thousands of years, um, reproduction was impossible. Huh? They, they would have to say, you know, for you know, thousands of years, maybe only a few people could actually have children and the entire rest of the world was barren. That is not likely. What's more likely is the population of the Earth started with a few people only 4,500 years to 5,000 years ago. Right around the time of Noah's flood, eight people being on an ark, which brings us to a total of about 9 billion people. Here's another one. You ever gone to a museum and seen fossils? Of course you have. Did you ever stop and ask yourself where those fossils came from? Because if I left a dead animal in my backyard, thousands of years from now, it will not become a fossil. Okay? It's gonna rot, it's gonna decay, and other animals are gonna come along and eat it and pick it apart. So where do fossils come from? Well, scientists will tell you that fossils come from catastrophes, fast catastrophes, that kill and bury the remains before the bodies can be destroyed. And a global flood is the best explanation for the fossils that we find today. Spectacular fossil graveyards have been found over the years, which is evidence that a sudden catastrophe buried thousands of animals, like a flood. Many caves and high uh, mountain ranges have been found with the varieties of remains of all sorts of animals that would point to a very sudden catastrophe. Animals that would never have been together, except if they were all fleeing a catastrophe, like a worldwide flood. These fossil graveyards they have found are also high in the mountain ranges. And they have marine animals and fish and sharks. How could they have gotten so high in these mountains if there wasn't a worldwide flood? Now, that's only evidence that's up high. We also have evidence that's down below. The Earth's crust has a massive amount of layered sedimentary rock, sometimes miles deep. These layers of sand and soil and material, they were formed by water, and they were once soft like mud, and now they're hard like stone. And encased in these sedimentary layers are fossils. Yes, billions of dead things, fossils of plants, animals, all buried very quickly. Now, It'd be great if we could just find Noah's Ark, right? Point to it and say, there it is. Leonard Nimoy looked for it in his In Search of TV special back in 1978, but he didn't find it. But we do have details about the boat in the Bible. Genesis 6 says, this is how high you are to make it, the length of the Ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Make a roof for the Ark and finish it a cubit above and set the door of the ark on its side. Make it with lower, second, and third decks. Noah's ark is not a big houseboat, right? A nice cute houseboat with giraffe heads peeking out the top. In fact, the dimensions here that we get, these are the size of a modern day cargo ship. The ark was 450 feet long. It was 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. It was a boat that was built to survive a global flood. A Korean research team back in 1992 took the dimensions of the ark and they tried to see if an ark of that size would really survive. And the whole team was spearheaded by a conservative evolutionist. The study confirmed that the ark could in, handle, could in fact handle waves as high as 98 feet tall. The, they, and they said, that the proportions of the biblical ark were perfect. And that study compared the ark against 12 other popular shapes of vessels. And the qualities that they measured, of course, were stability, whole strength, and comfort. And they said that Noah's ark was amongst the best designs. 
How could Noah have known how to build a proportionally perfect ship? Well, another argument about the boat would be, well, even with a boat that size, they couldn't have possibly held every living animal. You're right. Genesis 6 says, of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Other scientists got together to tackle this question, and they concluded that for us to see the animals that we see in the earth today, right, Noah would have needed about 16,000 animals. 16,000. In other words, the ark didn't need to carry every kind of animal. It only carried air-breathing animals, land-dwelling animals, creeping things, and things with wings, right? Winged animals. And if you want to cut down on space, you don't need full-grown animals, right? Younger animals require less food, less space, and they have smaller waist. And another factor which greatly reduces space is the fact that the tremendous variety of species that we see today back then didn't exist. So they don't need two of every breed of dog. They just needed a boy dog and a girl dog. And that would have given us all the species we see today. What about the argument that it's not possible for all the earth to have been covered with water? That a global flood isn't possible? Genesis 7 says the flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the face of the waters, and the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. Well, let's talk about this, this argument that the flood was local, but not global. All right, then why did Noah have to build an ark? Why did he have to build a boat? Couldn't he have just walked out of the way? All he has to do is get to the other side of the mountain range, right? As soon as he gets over there, he's safe. But then there would have been people living over there anyway. So what about all the people that lived everywhere else in the world? They would have survived. If, if it was God's judgment to wipe out everyone and to save Noah, why do that if it's a local flood? Lots of people would have been spared. The Bible says the waters rose 20 feet above the mountains. That's not possible if the flood is local. Water seeks to its own level. So it's not gonna rise to cover local mountains if the rest of the world is not touched. Plus, if the flood were a local flood, then God broke his promise. Because at the end of the story, he says, I will never do that again. Meaning, he will never do a global flood again. Never kill everyone in the human race again. But if he was just saying, well, I'll never do a local flood again, then he broke that promise because local floods happen all the time. But there is also evidence in the story itself. Passed down from generation to generation and culture to culture. That is evidence. Because... It's pretty cool to know that not just the Jews, but two other cultures wrote this story down. Guess what? There's actually more. Dr. Dwayne Gish, in his book, Dinosaurs by Design, said there are more than 270 stories like this. The story comes from Africa, Egypt, Inca, Tupi, Aztec, China, Iran, India, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Thailand, most of which carry the same theme with the same characters. But let me tell you why the biblical story of Noah is important. Let me tell you why, even with all these other stories being told, why the Jews felt it was important that they share their version of the story. We'll just, and, and we'll compare it and contrast it with the Epic of Gilgamesh, okay? We'll compare it with just that one story. First, the character of God. In the Gilgamesh story, there are five squabbling gods. They're fighting, and they're trying to you know, decide if they're gonna destroy everything. 
but one of those gods has second thoughts and decides to warn another human in a dream. This made the other gods mad, and they fought about it even more. When the Hebrews wrote their story, they said, no, there's only one God, and he's enough. And there's no spiritual conflict in the sky. There's no spiritual drama that takes place in the heavens. The conflict and the drama is us. It's down here on earth. We are the imperfect ones. In the Gilgamesh story, the gods are just as bad as the people they judge. And then you have the Noah character. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the hero is named Utnap Ishtim. That means he who saw is life. And the story makes him out to be a hero from the very beginning. He's strong, he's brave, he's a master sailor, and he's a master builder. He bravely lifts the sails to catch the wind. He uses his strength to turn the oars and the udders. The gods try to smash his boat with waves, but he uses his cunning and his wit to survive. And when his boat finally lands on land, he's given immortality as a reward. Noah's name means rest. Noah doesn't pilot the ship. He doesn't raise sails. He doesn't steer. He doesn't navigate. In fact, he doesn't do anything. He doesn't seem extraordinarily brave or witty. He's not very hero-like. He's just sort of ordinary. And when his boat lands, he was blessed with God's promises, but he wasn't given immortality. He died. You see, the flood stories from other cultures depict the gods as being out of control, and that the humans in the story, they regain control. The human shapes his surroundings. There's chaos, there's a flood, but the human, with his wit and his strength, he survives. He builds a boat and fixes his problems. But the Hebrews said, that's not exactly what happened. The Hebrews said there's only one God and he is perfect. God wasn't out of control, we were. God didn't mess things up, we did. There's nothing super special about us. God said, build a boat, we built a boat. God said, get in and buckle up. And that's what we did. The ark has no sail, no oars, no rudder, no steering wheel. And we only know that it had one window. Noah was, Noah was not in control. He was a passenger. God guided the boat because God was in control. And at the end of the story, it is still God who is in control, and it is only God who lives forever. And you know, when you think about it, the story of Noah is pretty graphic. It has very adult themes. Why do we teach this story to little kids? Why do we hang pictures of Noah's ark in the baby nursery? Oh, because the animals are cute, right? But a story about how God is angry and he sends a flood to kill everyone is very scary. And I can see the story of Noah being a good story about trusting God, right? It's a good story about obeying God. It's a good story about a God who keeps his promises. But is that everything? Can we find something new? In the epic story of Gilgamesh, the flood lasted a week, seven days, seven nights. Most biblical scholars estimate that Noah and his family spent a year inside the ark, a year, a year at sea. Now the pilgrims, they were on the Mayflower for 66 days. And in fact, today, using a vessel today, you could sail around the world in about 100 days. Noah and his family, a year. And he didn't raise a sail, steer with a rudder, turn the boat with a wheel. 
Genesis 7 says rain fell upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and his sons Shem and Ham and Japheth and Noah's wife and the three wives of the sons of with them entered the ark, they and every beast according to its kind and all the livestock according to their kinds, and every creeping things that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, every winged creature. They went into the ark with Noah, two and two of all flesh, in which there was the breath of life. And those that entered, male and female, all flesh, went in as God had commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. God closed the door. Because Noah was a passenger. What was the special thing that Noah did? He stayed in the boat. King David is a hero. Samson is a hero. Deborah is a hero. Joshua is a hero. Esther is a hero. Noah was a passenger. God told him to get in the boat. Noah stayed in the boat until God said to leave. Before Joanna and I moved to Texas, we lived with her mom for a year. We slept on an air mattress for a year. We both worked at jobs with very little pay. And it was during that time that jo Joanna read the story of Noah. And she would often tell me or her friends, right now, me and my family, we are in the ark. Meaning right now, we are in the storm. Right now, we are in the flood. The water is up over our heads and there is nothing we can do about it. When your job or the economy overwhelms you, when your body fails you, when your spouse or your family betrays you, and you can feel the water rise up and go 20 feet above the mountains. It's not a little bit of water here and none over here. It's chaos. It's everywhere. It's overwhelming and you feel like drowning. Naturally, your first instinct is to swim, to raise the sails, to grab something, to grab a wheel, to find a way out of this mess. And when the Hebrews tell the story to their children, they say, do you want to know how to survive a storm? You stay in the boat. God designed a perfect boat with no rudders, no sails, and a single window. God made a shelter to protect and it was a safe place if you stayed close. You'd stay safe if you stayed inside. Why do the Hebrews say that the solution to surviving a flood is to stay in the boat? Because that's where God is. You don't need to steer it. You don't need to control it. You just need to get in and stay in. <laughs> it's an incredible story of God's love, his protection during threat during turmoil, the best place to be is in the place that God has built. And the good news is, you don't have to build an ark. It's already been built for you. All you have to do is get in and stay in. The lesson of Noah is in his name. What did his name mean? It means rest. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. There's a lot of cool words there. The Hebrew word for shelter means a place to hide from your enemies. The Hebrew word for refuge means a place to run for safety. The Hebrew word fortress means the one who keeps me. When the storms of life come, when the floods of life come, and they will come, we will all need a resting place, a hiding place, an ark. The psalmist makes it clear that God is a refuge of rest. Look at other places in the Bible. Psalm 62, my soul finds rest in God alone. 
Matthew 11, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Psalm 9, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed and a stronghold in times of trouble. The biblical authors found in God a hiding place, a safe place, a resting place from the trials and tribulations and the troubles and the temptations and the terror of this world. Psalm 91 uses three words to talk about rest. But what's also interesting and very telling is that there's four names for God. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. The word the Most High in Hebrew is the word Elyon, and it means possession. The implication here is that God is the owner of everything. Fifty times in Scripture, God calls himself by this name. In heaven and earth, God says, I own it all because I made it all. The Hebrew word almighty is the word Shaddai, and it means provision. The picture here is that God is the provider of all. God is the one who gives us every single thing we need. The title of the Lord in Hebrew is the word Jehovah. It means promise. This was the greatest Hebrew name for God, the eternal one, the immutable, unchanging one, the great I am. He who promised to care for his people. And lastly, the Hebrew word my God is the word Elohim. And it means power. This word appears 2,700 times in scripture. And it is most often associated with the God of creation. Now read Psalm 91. El Yan, Shaddaiah, Jehovah, and Elohim is the God of possession, provision, promise, and power. Therefore, our God is a shelter of strength, a refuge of rest, a fortress of peace where you can find rest from the flood. And look, the verse even tells us how. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. What do we do? We dwell in the shelter. That sounds a lot like stay in the ark. This is the opposite of what the world teaches. It's the opposite of what a hero does. A hero takes action. A hero steers the ship. A hero sails against the waves. But look at what the biblical authors tell us to do. Exodus 33, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. 1 Peter 5, cast all your anxiety onto him because he cares for you. Philippians 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. What do those verses tell you to do? They all tell you to do the same thing. They tell you to rest. Sounds easy, right? It's not. Because we get distracted by the storm. We see it and we want to fix it. But when is it ever a good idea to jump out of the boat into the water? Noah said, never. But the good news is, if you find yourself out of the boat, you can always get right back in. In Mark, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Jesus' good news was that the kingdom of God was here. It was present. When he says at hand, he means it's close. And at many times you may try to solve your own problems and you will jump out of the boat. But Jesus promises that he will keep the kingdom close. He will keep the kingdom at hand. Author Anne Graham Lotz, she had her house broken into some years back, and the robbers took almost everything of value. And the night after the break-in, she lay awake in fear. She was overwhelmed with anxiousness, and she began to worry about all the other precious things in her life that she could lose. She could have an illness. There could be an accident. She could lose her children. She could lose her husband. She could lose her health. She could lose her job, her finances, her reputation. And she felt this worry of water rise up over her. And she recalled a passage, 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And Lot's immediately sat down and she began to make a list, an alphabetical list of all the blessings in her life that could never be taken away. She said, I am accepted by God, beloved by God, chosen by God, delivered by God, enlightened by God, forgiven by God. I have grace of God, hope for the future, inheritance in heaven, justification, knowledge of God, love, mercy of God, nearness to God, oneness with God, peace, and quickening of the Spirit. I am redeemed sealed with the Holy Spirit, treasured by God, united with other believers, and validated as an authentic child of God. She said, I have his wisdom, and one day I will be exalted with him. Do you have all of that? If you have Jesus, you do. And all you have to do is stay close. All you have to do is stay in the boat and rest. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this biblical story, a story that we see is told throughout the world from generation to generation, a powerful story of your might and your power but also how you rescued, how you gave one person a task, that they were obedient to that task, and they completely submitted their life to you without any need to take hold or direct or to steer. They trusted as you guided them to safety through the storm. Lord, even those who are listening to my voice right now, there are many going through a storm in life. Could be financial, could be with their health or with their family. Lord, I pray that you would give them rest. Give us rest as you carry us through the storm. Take away our anxiousness and our worry. Help us to rely on you to provide and to care that you will bring all things to a safe conclusion, that we will arrive on the shore one day and the boat will open. And it is then that we will sacrifice and we will praise you and thank you for your glorious fulfillment, your care, and your love and grace. Guide us to safety. And if it's been a month, give us patience. If it's been two months, Give us patience. If it's been a year, Lord, renew our strength and give us patience. As we wade out this flood, we know that your grace and your kingdom are right around the corner. So give each one rest. Give us rest. Give us rest. Amen. Hey, thanks for being with us this morning. Of course, I wanna remind you that we have two services every single Sunday, one at 9.30. It's a traditional service. We're gonna sing songs out of the hymnal. We've got a choir. We're gonna do responsive reading, say the Lord's Prayer, have communion. It's gonna be everything that you remember church to be as you grew up. And then between services, we have coffee and donuts. Please come for that. We wanna meet you, shake hands with you. And then at 11 o'clock, we have a contemporary service. We have a worship team. Come casual, come however you feel uh, natural and comfortable. We've got a full children's program from birth all the way through high school, and we would love to have them too. We wanna be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.